Hey everybody, I'm Stephen Brooks. I'm the Rubber Onion, and you're listening to the Rubber Any Animation Podcast. My co-host, as always on the show, is fellow animator Rob Yulfo. You will hear him, I promise. We're taking a one-week break on our freelancing school series to bring you a very special episode. I don't need to bury the lead. This week's episode is our interview with the great Don Bluth. I'm fairly in tune with my audience here. It wouldn't be a stretch at all to say this man needs no introduction, but I wouldn't be much of a host if I didn't. You'll know Don as the man who left Disney to create his own animation studio and actually compete with the giant. He made one of my favorite animated films of all time, The Secret of Nim, and followed it up in kind with movies like An American Tale, Land Before Time, All Dogs Go to Heaven. That new studio of a ragtag group of inspired artists showed that you can compete with Disney. On the ground front, he helped start a new wave of talented artists when the studio moved to Ireland, a place which hadn't seen productions in the level he was bringing up to that point, and now we're seeing great independent things from the Emerald Isle. He would then join forces with Fox to produce Anastasia and Titan AE, which was a sci-fi animated adventure movie which makes hand-drawn animation and computer model animation two years before Disney tried it with Treasure Planet. Without him, animation history would undoubtedly be very different. There's no doubt. That's what undoubtedly means. But it was actually in the time between his new studio's first movie, Secret of Nim, and its second, An American Tale, that they produced a game called Dragon's Lair. It was a fully animated adventure cartoon that you could actually play, and it was unlike anything anyone had seen at the time. It was so difficult, (laughs) but it was beautiful. Many people were clamoring for a full movie based on the game all the way back then. And now Don Bluth and his friend, fellow artist and producer Gary Goldman have started a crowdfunding campaign through Indiegogo to raise the money for a pitch video in order to make Dragon Slayer the movie. The campaign ends this Friday, January 15th. The link will be in the podcast post, but if you search Indiegogo, Dragon Slayer returns. It'll pop right up. You need to check out the perks. You'll get prints, autographs, production blogs and videos, art tutorials, and animation cells from some of their biggest movies that I mentioned earlier. Do yourself a favor, go check it out. On this episode, we talk with Don Bluth about his time at Disney and his decision to leave, his thoughts on sequels and CGI, the current landscape of animation and the internet, the importance of not dumbing things down for kids, and death. Yes, we actually talk about death. He also drops a reference to a man at Disney named Don Duckwall, and I can't believe I didn't notice it at the time of recording because, come on, there was a Donald Duckwall who worked at Disney. That's funny. Okay, no more stalling. Let's get right into the good stuff. I want to say welcome to episode 115 of the Rubber Onion Animation Podcast, and this one is simply titled The Don Bluth Interview. Enjoy. talking with Don Bluth. You know him from my favorite movies, Secret of Nim, American Tale, Land Before Time. Don, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Well, it's good to be here, actually. Uh, I'm doing a lot of broadcasts on pod these days, and so uh, it's kind of fun to meet new people, see their faces, and talk to people I can't even touch. (laughs) That's right. You have been doing a lot of interviews, especially now that your Indiegogo campaign for the Dragon Slayer movie is wrapping up on Friday. Yes. So I'd like to start by asking you a question that seems to have gone completely unnoticed completely overlooked in all those interviews. All right. Is it really true that all dogs go to heaven? (laughs) (laughs) Very, very good question. You know what? I've always believed that my whole life long because I think um, when you leave this world, it isn't the end of existence. I do believe there is a place that you go and and the spirit goes there. and, And all dogs and all cats and all trees and all bushes and everything that lives has a spirit in it. And it all goes somewhere. So it, it isn't something that just stops when you die here. And, and people who believe that it's just this and it stops, I feel bad because they don't have a lo- whole lot of hope. And it makes them panic. It makes them say, I've got to do it all and crowd it into this one life. Now, I'm not talking about reincarnation or anything, but I just think that we are eternal beings and that we continue to be on the grave. That was a really good answer. And you know what? I guess I would have expected nothing less from Don Bluth, who seems to have put death in all of your movies. <laughs> like in particular, Bambi is this thing that has reached the pop culture phenomenon to the point where people reference it. They say, you know, there's a Bambi moment for kids. I, either it was actually Bambi's mother or it was something else. For me, my Bambi moment was when Littlefoot's mother died right. in <laughs> the land before time. Right. Mm-hmm. And you did that to me. <laughs> I know you said many times before that you didn't want to talk down to kids and didn't want to shy away from real situations. 
You want to have reality, but also be rather optimistic, have a positive message, a positive impact. So is death specifically something that you wanted to include in all of your movies or did it just happen that way? It was, was it just because you weren't shying away from it? Well, I don't think any of us can shy away from death because, you know, we live in a world of death, whether it's sickness and all of the things that go along with death. We're constantly aging. So you begin to die and dying is actually a part of existence. So it's not something that I can avoid very much because it's part Part of uh, being alive. And I think when we were doing um, Land Before Time, it was it Steven Spielberg that brought it up. He said, we need to explain to people, you know, what's happened when Littlefoot loses his mother. What's happened there? Rather than just skirt around the issue and hide it and play like it doesn't exist, why not face it and say, you know, the great circle of life has begun again. So the mother does have to die. In fact, some philosophically and in all the myths that I know, idealistically, the parents have to die off for the young son or daughter to go on growing up. So there has to be cutting of that cord somewhere so that you can, you know, become a, a full mature human being. If you stayed in the cradle, and some people I know currently, 29, 30 years old, are still home with their parents. I say, well, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> somewhere you have to go out there and seek your own fortune and see what you can do on your own. You have to grow up. And part of growing up is facing the fact that you're going to go through different seasons in life. You know, you're going to go middle age. You're going to probably get married, have a family. You're going to watch your own kids grow up. Somewhere you're going to go through the autumn of your life. You will probably, you know, start experiencing the body, you know, falling apart or not functioning as well as it used to. And then somewhere you prepare to die. And in the death, there's an exciting moment there because at least you'll be able to solve some of the problems that plague us all. What goes on after? So you get to walk through the door and it's it's too bad that people can't come back and tell us, <laughs> but I'm sure there's something going on there. So if you do an animated film, not just a cartoon in which you're trying to make people laugh all the time and forget, I think in that moment when you do animate a film, you need to explore all the things that we are as humans and death is part of it. That's interesting because Disney seemed to also not shy away from it early on, brought up Bambi, but I know that it's kind of a legend over your break with Disney Animation Studios and mm -hmm. where you left to form Don Bluth Productions as it was first call with Gary Goldman, yeah. your partner on the Indiegogo campaign, which is going very well. Reminder, it ends on Friday. So if you want the perks, go check them out. But I wanted to say that the, the question that I have is kind of around that legend. I'm very interested in the genesis of the decision to leave Disney because as legend has it, you went into a meeting and someone told you something you didn't like. And then you said, <laughs> okay, well, we're going to go compete with you. And and then you just, okay, I'm just going to leave and compete. That was a straw that broke the camel's back kind of situation. But yeah. I'm very interested in the conversations that led up to it. I mean, it couldn't have been a completely spur of the moment decision, right? Well, the lead up to that starts years and years ago. I mean, when I was four years old, I saw Snow White. I liked it. I liked the look of it. I liked the message of it. I liked everything it was saying there. And it was something that I carried home with me and I, I would try and draw the things I saw on screen. And then the, the name Walt Disney kept coming up. And I figured there's the man that made it. So my whole life long as I went through high school and, uh, and went through college and everything, I, I kept saying, I, I want to go work there. I want to go work there. That was my dream. So when I went to work there, Walt was still alive. And this was in 1955. Uh, we were making Sleeping Beauty. He at the same time had left the studio a little bit and had gone down to Anaheim to create something called the Magic Kingdom. So that was what was going on at the time we were making Sleeping Beauty. And I noticed that Sleeping Beauty was supposed to have been, and it was worded about throughout the whole studio, that this was the penultimate expression of animation. It was going to be flawless. It was done in widescreen, and everybody was drawing on paper that was very, very wide. Uh, no computers to help you at all. Everything was hand done. That was an era, I call it the golden age of animation, you know, where Walt's influence and his spirit about what he believed in telling stories was everywhere. And, and it kind of influenced the way I thought. And then I watched as he got older... The enthusiasm for animation died off a little bit, and he and he even said vocally, it's a little hard nowadays. I think the animation is too expensive to produce. Uh, about what year was that that we're talking? Well, this is about the same year, 57, 58. Okay, so it was during production. Yeah, and, and he's staying, you know, but, but he's going now into animatronics. He's going into something that he create these creatures that are all have these little tubes in them that cause the creature to move. I think Lincoln was the first one that I saw. And it was over in the ink and paint department for weeks 
we used to go over and look at it on our break times, and we'd look at it and we'd say, I don't know what that is he's making. <laughs> and then one day we went over there, and they were demonstrating it, and this, this thing, without any skin on it, stood up and said, four score and seven years. And I went, yeah, that, I went whoa. That does sound like the beginning of a sci-fi movie. He's just building a robot <laughs> army of animatronic presidents that are going to take over the yes. world. Just started shooting lasers out of his eyes. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, that was startling because I thought, wait a minute, I thought we were drawing this kind of thing, but suddenly he's got one in the real world. Uh, and then what followed, everyone knows, is Disneyland became, you know, the place where he was trying to create life and do it in a different way. Onto the scene came this thing called computers, and computers began to really help us in a way because they kept track of all the pieces that go into making a picture. And all those pieces were just you know, so, much, so much easier. And you could now color things in the computer. You could do all kinds of stuff. But then with the computer came something called computer-generated images, which is animation. I have a theory about this is that after Disney died, in 1966, the studio tried to go on without him by saying things like, quote, what would Walt have done? And instead of having a new prophet to help them, it was what would he have done? And everybody tried to guess it. So the pictures began to have kind of a samey look about them. They weren't reaching out to unexplored territory. And then suddenly along comes this uh, computer animation and is able to entertain very well. And it looks different. It doesn't look like the old traditional style. The traditional style, by the way, was the stuff that was in the nursery that raised kids because it was made, a lot of it, for children. And parents took their children to it because they thought it was fairy tales. Then what happens is when young men get to be about 12, 13, 14, the hormones start to happen and they say, hey, I want out of the nursery. <laughs> so what goes out of the nursery with it? You dump the animation that used to be the, the babysitter. And then you could go to see equal stories, like fairy tale stories. You could see those in a different format, which was computer-generated images. And it was okay to go to that and it didn't threaten your manhood. Okay, so what you're talking about right now is modern CGI, as we know, a computer model animation, Pixar and yes, and sort of modern thing. CGI. So the idea being that traditional animation, uh, hand-drawn animation, had been stigmatized to being associated to just animated films for kids, right? And the fact that CGI comes in and it looks like something a bit different. It didn't get lumped in with that stigma. That's correct. Then the question kind of becomes, from your perspective, do you think that CGI can avoid that fate of repeating that history? Or is it just a foregone conclusion? It depends. Right now, CGI is a genre that entertains teenagers as well as you know children and everything. So it doesn't really have the same stigma placed upon it. But it remains to be seen that there may be a generation that's ready to stuff that doesn't look as traditional hand-drawn as a babysitter. So therefore, it would have a chance to resurrect. So is that what you think the key is to overcoming that stigma for traditional animation? It's just time. Time away from the limelight. Time to separate itself from that Well, was there one other very, very important element, and that is good scripts. I had a chance one time to work with a very, very good writer named Robert Town. And Robert Town, who wrote uh, Tequila Sunrise, said one time, he said, the problem with most animated films that I see is that they're written specifically for children. What you should do is write a script that really has some maturity to it and do it for the adults and allow them to just enjoy it. And Walt himself, he says, I don't, I'm not making animation for children. I'm making animation for people. But somehow uh, parents began to see it as, maybe because of cartoons, to see it as children's entertainment. So I, I think it had an unfortunate um, existence, and so it died. And what's happening right now, I think that's really important, is that with the CG and with the computers, we have to ask ourselves, is there another genre that we've just thrown out, like you threw out the baby with the bath? And maybe we should see if we can resurrect that, because it can tell stories if you've got a good story to tell. It's definitely what I admired about uh, some of your work. Like, All Dogs Go to Heaven, that's pretty much a, an adult cartoon, but enough that it gives kids a, a glimpse of what uh, a dark side of an adult's life can be, you know, gambling and smoking and drinking and assassination and yeah. just uh, heavy subjects but it still was lighthearted and, and some poor little girl trying to find a home you know trying to find set of parents because she's an orphan everybody has got problems in that movie yeah yeah but that's what I loved about it and by the way that title was something that was um, it was a book that someone read to me when I was in the fourth grade maybe third grade and um, and so when I heard that, and I've always loved the title, All Dogs Go to Heaven, because I've had several dogs in my life. So I went and tried to find the book. And when I found the book, and she used to read it to us, this teacher did, every day she'd read us a little bit out of this book called All Dogs Go to Heaven. So I went and found the book, looked at it, and it was an anthology of dogs. There was no story at all. 
<laughs> it's like reading from the phone book. And I, yeah, she was making it all up. And so, so what happened? I said, well, the title's great. Maybe we should write a story that fits it. We kind of talked about some of the traditional methods of, of animation. We talked a bit about CGI, but there's one factor in this that actually will lead up to the Indiegogo campaign specifically, which is the internet. Yeah. We've talked about this a few times on the podcast, that there's an accessibility to hand-drawn animation and that every kid draws. Mm. Not every kid makes computer models. There seems to be this resurgence of hand-drawn animation, but also appreciation for hand-drawn animation. Right. We all know that technology is a double-edged sword, but I want to know what your thoughts are on the internet and technology's role in the resurgence of hand-drawn animation, or at least the appreciation thereof. Does it have a role to play in this? Absolutely. I mean, I think the uh, what's happened with the, the viral world, if you will, or the digital world that we all live in nowadays, it's there as a tool. But the real, real challenge, I think, is the creativity of your own mind. What are you able to conceive of that the tool can help you get there? And certainly, the computer's made it so easy to keep track of your drawings, to photograph the drawings, to edit the drawings, to do, to color them. I mean, ink lines, which we thought disappeared with, um, what would it be, 101 Dalmatian, suddenly went to Xerox and all the lines were scratched. Suddenly you can change the color of all the lines any way you want to with a computer. So you can make something that is beautiful to look at and the computer can help you get there. But the computer can't help you conceive ideas. It can't help you um, create a story that touches the human heart. It's not not something that you can say, well, if it's computer done, well, then it's easier. Few people know this, but the computer films have been made out there, even Frozen, Inside Out. Those things are costing about $250 million to produce. You could easily do a hand-drawn for somewhere between 50 and $60 million. So, I mean, there's a huge gap there. The computers cost a lot of money to do all that. But again, some of the pictures for me that are done in CG work beautifully and the stories are great. And some, no. All of this is just making, what, wisecracks or funny little jokes or one-liners. But there's nothing for me to take home. You know, when I go see Bambi and I watch what happens to his mom and how the father rescues him and takes him off and goes on teaching him as a parent and he still grows up and finds Feline, I take that home and I think about it. When I go see, and I'm not going to name any names here, but when I go see uh, some of these animated computer, I, I have nothing to take home. Yeah, that's interesting. Actually, as you were talking, I was going to look this up, uh, but I figured you might know. I, I had watched Bambi recently, and I think I remember that Bambi was just a shy over 60 minutes, right? Uh, 69 minutes. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of movie to pack in to 69 minutes. And what's even more astounding is in Bambi, there's less than a thousand words spoken. Wow. So they're really not telling you, you know, big long lines and they're not joking with you to make you laugh in your chairs. They're telling you a very, very poetic story. What I think is interesting, too, with Bambi, I don't know whether many people know this, but a lot of the backgrounds were oil paintings. Yeah, I think I saw that in the special features. And they had to wait for them to dry, and it really did damage to the budget. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were trying all kinds of ways to get these backgrounds to actually dry so they could shoot the scenes. Oh, no. So we're talking about traditional techniques, and I'm fascinated with The, the Secret Nim. It's one of my favorite movies, and I've never really had the opportunity to confirm some of these things that I've read. So my first question is about color. What I had read is that instead of having overlays to create different different colors. You guys had created individual color palettes for every lighting situation. And I believe the main character, Mrs. Brisby, had something like 46 different color palettes. Is that right? That sounds right. Yeah. Every time a character walks into a different light, as they would on a stage play, when they walk into a different light, it changes all the colors. So we were constantly trying to use colors that would orchestrate an emotion. And we use something called orchestration of color. And I think animation is like visual music. So that if it's done right to a rhythm, and if the colors psychologically are expressing the same emotion, then you get a very, very impactful piece of work. Because you, if I'm doing something very sad, for example, in a character, like Little Fifel in American Tale, where he is down and out, well, then you're going to go into the colors that say down and out, which are cool colors and blues and drab and gray. And as he finally finds his parents in those final scenes, well, then the colors are going to move towards amber. They're going to move towards something that feels like the sun is coming out, you know, and you feel that. And by the way, Walt said something this interesting too, and in a book called The Analysis of Action, he asked his, uh, one of his employees named Don Graham to go in there and educate the animators as to what their job was. 
And he says, the job is to touch the emotions of the audience and make them feel things about life that they're living through, but do it by exaggerating your animation. So by using caricature, you must touch something they're really living through in their real life. He says, if they have no experience of what you're trying to say, they won't get it. So it's really, really important that you're inspired by what happens in real life, not just telling jokes. We have stand-up comics that do that very well. <laughs> but uh, Sequels, uh, as far as like sequels go for, or stuff that you weren't involved in. What, what's your opinion on that? Like, as far as, like, let's say, Fiber Goes West, uh, <laughs> all 52 of the Land Before Time series. Yeah, we did American Tale, and after American Tale, we had moved the entire studio over to Dublin, Ireland, because we had to to be able to um, make Land Before Time. So we moved to Ireland. Uh, and I do remember that Stephen sent Kathy Kennedy and, and somebody else over there at the time to say, Stephen wants to make American Tale 2, a sequel, but he wants you to do it for less. Hmm. We had a CEO with us in Ireland at the time that said, we can't do that. We can't. I remember saying, I don't think we can do this. I mean, we, we at least have to have the same amount to be able to do it in Ireland. And I remember Kathy saying, are you sure you want to say no? Whoa. And, and I said, well, I, I, you got me between a rock and a hard place. Um, I think we have to say no. The sequel went somewhere else. It went to England and went to America, went everywhere and cost them a heck of a lot more than if we had done it. Oh, wow. I know about sequels is that the sequel better deliver at least as much emotional intensity as the original. If not, the only reason to make it is because you think you can make more money. Uh, and and money's important. I, I grant that. But at the same time, so is art. And if you don't artfully do something and you don't affect people's lives to make the, the life quality better, I don't know why you're doing it. If you just work for the dollar, I think uh, you do everybody a disservice. Okay, so I, I really wanted to talk about Secret of Nim, but we're running a little short on time, and I do want to talk about Dragon's Lair, which is the project that you work on directly after Secret of Nim. But before we do that, uh, I'm thinking maybe maybe we'll just do some rapid fire. I'll read off some things and... <laughs> bless you. Someone I'll, sneezing I'll in the background. <laughs> I'll shorten what it is. <laughs> uh, so... Okay, oh, so, uh, but, oh, it's, oh, that's a dog. That's not dog sneezing. I thought it was someone sneezing. <laughs> I have two that dogs. That is a dog. So, uh, just to get people up to speed, you worked at Disney, and then you left to form your own company with Gary Goldman and uh, a few others, and, and that was in uh, uh, 1979. Now, before that happened, as I understand it, and this is what I'd like to uh, confirm first, if, if you're privy to this information is that I heard that Disney was offered the rights to Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, that book, back in 1972, but they passed on it. Is that true? Uh -huh. Is it true? Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim was a, a story that they were considering in there, and Ken Anderson was actually working on it. He kept recommending it to the entire staff. This would be a great story. But everyone kept saying, no, 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 we've got other things on the agenda, so we never did it. When we left Disney Studio to go out and form our own studio, th there was no one who had optioned that story. So we said, what's well, a great story. Ken said it was a great story. Let's grab it and go with it. So we did. So Aurora Productions, I'd also read that they were also Disney expats, that they were Disney executives that had left to form their own production company. You're all gathering together trying to you know, <laughs> do this new thing. They snatched up the rights to the book that Disney had passed on seven years earlier. Correct. And they had given you an initial budget, which I think is uh, unadjusted for inflation, $5.7 million to make it in only 30 months? Something like 30 months is correct. I think it turned out to be 6.2. We had made a picture prior to that, which was a little short called Banjo the Woodpile Cat. And because we were trying to learn the lessons of how to put together an animated film and, you know, how to put a sad scene and a happy scene or a restful scene or whatever. So the continuity of a film was pleasant to look at. We had learned those lessons by making this little short called Banjo the Woodpile Cat. Well, we showed that to a man in Chicago Chicago, Aurora was involved in this and showed it to a man. And this man says, well, if you can do that, you could probably do a feature. And we said, yeah, we could. He said, okay, I'll fund it. It was that simple. I'll fund the picture. Tell me how long. Let's make it about 30 months and let's make the picture. That's when we went back to Disney's and said, we've been given an opportunity to go out there and make a movie and leave you here. And they laughed. It was a guy named Don Duckwall. He just laughed the loudest and he says, you can never do that. He says, you don't have an idea of what you're even saying. You cannot make a feature film. We struggle to make one. And you think you can go out there and do it? He says, you'll fail. Oh, geez. Poking the bear. When uh, when was this? Oh, this you? is back in uh, 50. 
58. So, and, and we said, we don't think we will. We were highly innocent <laughs> and very, very naive. And so we said, well, we're going to do it. And 17 of us left. And it was during the time they were making The Fox and the Hound. And I had risen in the studio to the point of being a director producer. So I was up there pretty high in the studio and they weren't happy with me at all. And it got a lot of press, you know, and we were called the traitors and, and, and the, everything else in the world. But we knew that we had to do it for a very specific reason. And that is my allegiance was to Walt and the beauty that he created that lightened my life. And I figured they were taking so many things off the screen that was beautiful in the name of economics. So I said, what we can do is we can go out there and we can try and bring back a lot of things that you have now taken out of the pictures, which I call beautiful. And he says, you mean you're going to compete with us? And I said, well, that sounds a little you know, ambitious, but I guess that's what we're going to do. And so we did. Ever since then, it's been just this battle where they, they say, you're on our turf. What are you doing on our turf? Get away. You can't do this. We managed to make 12 animated films before they were able to checkmate. <laughs> That is possibly one of the coolest sentences that has ever been uttered on this podcast. So the story of Secret Nim continues with the distribution. United Artists was the original distributor. And it seems from the things that they had released that they really appreciated the artistic skill that went into it. But then they were bought out by MGM. Uh, pre-Turner days, which really disrupted the ultimate distribution of Secret of Nim. Yeah, we, we were doing very well with United Artists, but th there was a picture that got, there's a ripple of principle that happens, you know. There was a picture out there called um, Heaven's Gate, made by Michael Cimino, and it nearly wrecked, or maybe it did wreck the United Artists company. It cost so much money, and it didn't make any money back, and so United Artists got sold to MGM. When that happened, Secret of Nim was sold to MGM. And so it means that the, our distribution deal with United Artists went up in smoke. And there was a man who came in who was now in charge of MGM UA and said, I don't like animation. Don't spend any money distributing this. So we said, what? <laughs> At that point, what Aurora said, who were, you know, the producers, they said, we'll go out and do a dog and pony show and raise some money to see if we can't get it into the theater. So that's how it got distributed. The other factor here in the distribution was the competition that was out at the time. I really just want to read these out to refresh people's memories and to maybe refresh your own. The competition at the time, the movies that Secret of Nim was competing against in theaters at the time was E.T., Poltergeist, Rocky III, <laughs> wow. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, <laughs> Diner, and Disney's own Tron. <laughs> I read this from a review that had been published back then at the time that was archived on the internet from the magazine. Anyone can see it. Is that the only movies that beat Secret of Nim in the theaters where Secret of Nim was actually showing were E.T. and the Oscar-winning Diner. Yeah. So it did really well where it was shown. Rotten Tomatoes even now has a 96% fresh rating. Was that report accurate? Yes, that is correct. And Aurora knew very well it said that our competition was E.T. from Steven Spielberg, and they said, that's going to just kill us. That's going to be so hard. Uh, and we knew, and we're braced for that very thing, that that would happen. But the the critics in the newspapers and the magazines and everything were liking the picture and gave it a really, really good report card. But financially, it didn't do well. So after it was over, all of us 17 people who had walked so proudly out of Disney Studio went back sniveling to our desks and said, whoa, <laughs> you know, now what do we do? Because uh, there were homes and wives and children to support. So along came something just out of the blue, like, you know, we had a, a, a muse looking over us. And the, what it was was a guy named Rick Dyer who said, I want to make a video game and I want to make it about a little knight you know, who goes into a castle and saves a princess who is in distress. And, and I want you guys to animate it because I've seen Secret of Nim and I want it to look like that. So we said, sure, we have nothing to do. <laughs> so we took we took on that. I know nothing about games and I'm very bad about playing, you know, video games. So I had to learn a lot to be able to even storyboard it or lay it out or, you know, organize it so it could move through the studio departments. It became probably one of the best things that we did. And it was just done as a lark. We were just trying to stay employed and have a lot of fun. But it connected somehow. And I think it's because of the character of the little knight who is just a bungler, which most of us are. And um, he won anyway. <laughs> I remember being a kid and just uh, seeing that at the arcade and just questioned, like, that's really a video game? It was amazing watching over the shoulder. Actually, it was one of those things where initially I was wondering, is he actually playing the game or is this the video that they show before the game starts? Yeah. Like, is he standing in front of it watching <laughs> it? It was incredible. And I actually saw it was gameplay and it blew my mind because it's one of those, wait, you could do 
games this way? It was playing and watching a movie. There are a lot of games now that even have those types of mechanics where it's essentially yeah. a movie and there are many options like a choose your own adventure where you make one decision and the story continues or you make another decision and you die. And that was another one of the big things about watching that game was watching Dirk die. Because yeah, you know it's a everyone... very hard game. <laughs> Again, we're on the subject of death. <laughs> That's, <funny. laughs> That's true. That's true. At least in this way, it's on the other side of it, where it's less Bambi dying and more Bill Murray and Groundhog Day dying. <laughs> so I'm really curious about the name Dragon's Lair, because every time I say it out loud, it comes out Dragon Slayer. Was that on purpose? That it, Was it a play on words? It's a Slayer cover band, I think. Well, you know, that was that was this guy, Rick Dyer. He came up with that title, Dragon's Lair. You have to stop after the first <laughs> word, Dragon's Lair. <laughs> So on to the Indiegogo campaign. This is what you're here to talk about and promote. You guys have started a Kickstarter. You're off to a good start and it stalled a little bit. And as I understand it, Indiegogo then approached you yeah. and said, look, you got a good thing going here. It's just the way that it was presented could be improved a little bit. When you relaunched with Indiegogo, it was a well-presented campaign. And the fact that you had shifted from Kickstarter to Indiegogo, no one's dealt to Kickstarter, but you had learned a lot through that initial process. And now the Indiegogo campaign has funded and exceeded the initial call for funding. And now you're up to, what was it, like the, the third? We're or on our third uh, level. We've got about, I think it's the figure is 389. There's a lot of fans of Dragon's Lair, the game. And there's a lot of fans of of traditional animation and there are a lot of fans of yours you put those things together and when you have the option of possibly seeing a dragon's lair the movie something that people had been wanting for such a long time people are excited i will say that the the perks and rewards this time around are huge incentive which i encourage again people should go check that out there will be a link on the podcast post you can click that and go check out the indiegogo campaign for dragon's lair the movie look at the perks look at the things that you will get because the other thing that we have to touch on is that you're not funding the movie but you're funding a i believe it's four minute sizzle reel to shop around and and get funding for the ultimate movie. Yeah, we're going to make a four-minute reel. We've had a hard time getting people to understand we're not making the feature out of that money. So what we're doing is we're making a four-minute reel which demonstrates what the story could be. So it's kind of like an, an outline or a treatment of what the story is going to be. Most of it's going to be storyboarded, so you'll see visuals. But there'll be one minute and 20 seconds of it that will be fully animated and in color the old-fashioned way. So that's going to be there. Now, will that sell people to want to put up money to make a $50, $60 million movie? Maybe, maybe not. But I think what will sell them is a dynamite script. So that's what's where some of the money's going. That script is really important. Do you have any specific ideas about uh, who the writer is going to be or who you'd like him or her to be? Um, we're talking to two or three writers right now, you know, and we're trying to find out the, what's the best deal and who's good at comedy and who's good at really just good story. But we need a comic writer for sure because it, it has to be a funny film. I mean, the game is funny. But at the same time, there's me saying, what's the take home? You know, you're not just going to watch a bunch of jokes and gags and then walk out of the thing that we did our job because that wouldn't be it. There has to be something for you to take away that to ponder, to think about. Right. Just like we talked about before, not shying away, not dumbing down for kids, but also not dumbing down for mass general audiences. And again, somehow death. But do you know what the message of the film is going to be? Or are you still kind of waiting on a more flushed out story to get there? We, you know, well, we're still batting around with that. But, you know, most stories that I like, you know, and, and I, I point to Star Wars, it's the battle between good and evil. And it's always that, you know, and in all of its forms, evil is tantalizing, it's fun, it's attractive, it's pleasurable, it's all of that. And over on the good side, maybe not as much fun <laughs> for some reason. Milton wrote a thing called Paradise Lost. He also wrote a book called Paradise Regained. Paradise Lost is about Satan coming in and, you know, and screwing everything up so that paradise is lost. And the one that it became popular and everyone reads is Paradise Lost, but no one reads the one that's about the good guy, Paradise <laughs> Regained. In fact, nobody's ever heard of it. So I use that as an example and say, if you really want to attract people, you have to tell them something about the bad guy and see how bad the guy really is. And, and some of their parents, of course, are going to scream at me and say, yeah, but you're scaring my children. I said, well, yes, but I'll also rescue them so that at the end of it they're gonna go oh wow oh that's kind of nice you know but you can't feel one emotion yeah. without the other those are the i mean it's a wonderful life it's a, it's a terrible <laughs> movie it's an awful movie if you only watch the first like two oh, thirds of it, it you know <laughs> like, you have to watch that ending in order to feel better i know it's kill me now <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> okay weird transition but now uh we have some audience 
questions. I put a call out on Facebook for people to submit their questions, and we had a ton of them. We're running a little long on time here. I want to make sure I don't take up too much of your time. So I'm going to pick a couple of the questions here and just ask those. So to those of you who submitted uh, your audience questions, I'm sorry if I, I couldn't get to them, but hopefully we covered them in the body of the show. So the first question is one from Lamont Wayne. And this is directly about the Indiegogo campaign. So I think it's an appropriate question to start with. So he says he'd like to ask who they would pitch the Dragon's Lair movie to. And he really hopes that Netflix is on that list. Oh, you know, that's that's great because we actually have had dialogues about that very thing. Uh, Netflix and, and also Amazon is also doing pictures. But I, I don't know whether they're funding pictures that go directly to the big screen or whether it's for the small screen. So uh, definitely we will be contacting them. We've had some interest from um, some of the other agencies in Hollywood, which I can't talk about right now, but we're definitely out there doing that before the Indiegogo uh, crowdfunder is over because uh, we won't be successful in this until we actually make the movie, not four minutes worth. We're going to make the movie. All right. Our second question that I picked out here is uh, James T. Nethery asked a question about uh, casting, which I found pretty interesting. He says, I've always heard from people who have worked for you that you would usually cast your animators by sequence instead of by character like the Disney studio did. So instead of an animator working on one character throughout the film, they get a bit of every character. Was there a specific reason for this style of casting? Yeah, you know what? We we sort of adopted that uh, in Ireland at some point because we found some animators were really good at the human figure while others just couldn't do it at all. We found some animators could do scary and, and like to do uh, really, really dark figures and villainous expressions where the, the comics are harder to find. Somebody that does something that's very funny and very comical. So you, wound, you found out that, you know, you use the resources as animators. You use them at what they're best at. And it's the best way to go about it. If you assign someone to do the human figure who can't even draw the human figure, you're already in trouble. Okay, it's funny that you bring up drawing the human form because I heard a story that Gary, Gary Goldman, your partner throughout the years and on this Indiegogo campaign for the Dragon's Lair movie, is it true that he gave you his Playboy magazines in order to design Daphne? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gary loves that story. <laughs> No, it, it, it came to uh, to doing the Daphne for uh, Dragons of the Game. And he said, look, let me help you out here. He says, I, I know you probably will hate this, but I'm going to bring you some Playboys. And I want you to look through there and look at some of these girls and the poses they get in and, you know, and what looks really sexy on in a magazine. And I said, OK, I'm up for that. So he brought in the Playboys. And yeah, I sure <laughs> See, did. Mom, if you're listening, I'm studying this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and the last question that I picked out here was that you've had a theater. You've had a playhouse for many years, and we didn't get to touch on that in the body of the interview. So I thought this was a good question to end with. Kaishu Manella asks, what was your experience working on plays? And my kind of follow-up question is, what's going to happen to the playhouse once the Dragon's Lair movie kicks into full gear? The, the theater, yeah. I found out, this is very strange, I found out that um, what you do as a storyboard person is that you're actually learning how to block characters or tell them where they move. Now, these are just drawings I'm talking about. But where does the character move when he's saying a line? Uh, what is the lighting? What is their relationship to two characters having a conversation? All of those things that you do as a storyboard person, you will actually do as a director of a real play. So, And when it comes to musicals, like in a, in a musical comedy, People dance and sing and do all kinds of stuff on that stage, which are patterns on the stage. So the same things, the same principles that I used in storyboarding, I would use in the theater. Now, what's going to happen to the theater if I'm over here making a movie? I'm going to get other people to go over there and direct the plays and still keep it going because I learn things from watching actors. If anybody wants to be an animator, for sure, study acting because that's what you are. Even though you draw your characters, you're an actor. And if you don't know how to act, then your characters will simply move, but they won't be alive. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know that I could talk for hours about production details and animation history, but our time is up. <laughs> and I just, I, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on the show. It was an absolute blast. I know that I speak not only for myself, and I'm sure Rob feels the same way, oh, but also for yes. the fans who are listening. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing what you're doing. And I mean this honestly. Come back anytime. Okay. Steven and Rob, thank you guys. You've been great. Oh, thank you. And um, we'll talk again sometime, I'm sure. That'd be great. Yeah, it was a real treat to get to talk to you and uh, after following your work for so long. I appreciate the time and the answers that you gave. And I'm, I'm also under the weather today, and I don't know whether this is really happening or it's a really awesome fever dream. <laughs> it's not really happening. <laughs> it's not really happening. <laughs> thank you guys a lot. Uh, thanks thank a lot, Don. 
And that'll do it for this episode of the Rubber Onion Animation Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this special episode because I know that I did. You should absolutely check out the Dragon's Lair Indiegogo page because remember, it concludes this Friday, January 15th. So if you want those perks like autographs, access to the production blogs, art tutorials, and actual animation cells from some of their biggest movies, you got to get in there, people. It's called Dragon's Lair Return. So if you Google that, you'll find it. But if you're on the podcast post right now, you'll see links for it. As he said in the interview, they've already made the amount that they needed. But this is a chance to get some amazing things like I mentioned earlier. And also, who doesn't want to be part of a winning team? Am I right? I'd also like to thank my co-host, Rob, who was actually sick during this recording and did not completely fall apart. Thank you, Rob. You can and should follow him. He is Rob Yulfo, Y-U-L-F-O. If you Google him, you will find his stuff. We are making a page for him, which isn't up yet, but you can bookmark it. It'll be MrRobYulfo.com. He's pretty much everywhere I am. And I am Stephen Brooks. I am The Rubber Onion. And you can follow me at Rubber Onion everywhere. On Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Tumblr, Google+, Newgrounds, SoundCloud, and Instagram. The Rubber Onion Animation Battle this month is Casual Friday Gone Wrong. If you want to participate, just make any animated sequence under 15 seconds by the end of the month and tag it with hashtag Rubber Onion Battle on Instagram. So I'll, I'll watch Twitter too if you want to do that. I, I know, I understand not everybody has Instagram. If you want to support Rubber Onion, check me out on Patreon. If you want to support Rubber Onion without giving me money, please rate and review us on iTunes. That helps out a lot, believe it or not. That was not an intended rhyme. It's just... Right place, right time. I can't stop. But the main place to go for all things Rubber Onion is rubberonion.com, where you can find this podcast and my blog. And you can pre order my book, which is currently called Tradigital Flash 12 Principles of Animation in Adobe Flash. That is up on Amazon. The name is getting changed, but the pre order link is going to be the same. The name is getting changed to Tradigital Animate CC 12 Principles of Animation in Adobe Animate. The link will also be up on the podcast post. And next week, we are back with part two of our four part series on how to start. A freelance animation business and the topic is creating your brand thanks for listening to another episode of the rubber Dan animation podcast if you like it subscribe tell your friends about it and don't forget to say hi bye see you next week